program is the uh, Austin E. Owen Lecture. And I want to just tell you very briefly a little bit about um, uh, Austin E. Owen. The lecture series was established in 1990 by Dr. Judith Owen Hopkins, Hopkins and uh, her husband, Dr. Margaret Hopkins, in honor of her father, retiring um, Judge Austin E. Owen. Judge Owen had attended uh, Richmond College and, and received his law degree from the University of Richmond in 1950. He was assistant United States Attorney for the East of Virginia and a partner in Owen, Guy, Rose, Betts, Smith, and Dickerson. In 1974, Judge Owen was appointed as a judge of the Second Judicial Circuit of Virginia and served until his retirement in 1990, um, serving two years as chief judge. The, the lecture series was established with the idea that it would uh, take place at the beginning of the academic year and set the tone uh, for the, uh, the rest of the, the year. And I can't think of a better way to do that than this fabulous conference. Uh, brings together this amazing group of scholars and policy makers talking about one of the most important issues that's confronting labor and employment right now. Um, just is, is a wonderful, wonderful way to integrate theory and practice and have all of you, including our students, think hard about these very, very challenging questions. So, so uh, with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce the audience, who's been the organizer of this wonderful program. So thank you. Delighted to have all of you here at our conference. Um, thank you so much for coming. And we have a wonderful program for you today, some terrific speakers coming up. Um, I want to, first of all, um, just tell you a few logistical things about the day. Um, and then I want to thank some folks, and then we'll get started on our program. Um, there are out on the table out there, in case you didn't pick them up when you came in, we have both MCLE forms for those of you who are looking for CLE credit. We also have forms for those folks who are looking for human resource certification. And if you didn't get those when you came in, um, pick them up on the table outside. In addition, there are a couple of issue briefs there um, from the American Constitution Society on some public sector issues. And that's one of our co-sponsors, and if you'd like to pick those up, those are not included in the materials online, but there are hard copies out there, and feel free to pick those up. The bathrooms, when you're looking for them, are down the hallway past the registration table. Um, as the hotel described it to me, turn right at the sticks down there, and uh, that's why you find the bathrooms when you need them. Um, we'll be uh, breaking for lunch at 12.30, and we will have box lunches out on the table outside where the muffins were. Um, you can go out and pick up a lunch and bring it back in and um, eat at your seat here. And um, we won't have any uh, presentations during lunch, but we'll start up again at 1.30. Any questions you have, feel free to find me or check with the folks at the registration table out there and they'll be able to help you. A couple people ask about internet access. It is not available in the room, but it is available outside the room and you should be able to get on without a password for those of you that need to do that. Um, I wanna thank some folks who were involved in, in putting this program together. Um, of course, um, I'd like to thank the, the donors of the Austin Owen Lecture um, at the University of Richmond. Uh, our co-sponsors, the Labor Law Group, um, which is a group, a national group of labor and employment law scholars. They're one of our co-sponsors and actually the initiator of the idea for this symposium. And particularly, I'd like to thank uh, Mary Crane, who's the chair of that group, and um, Marty Allen and Joe Slater, who are members of the group, um, my co-authors on the public sector casebook, and helped plan the program and put this program together. The American Constitution Society, another one of our co-sponsors, um, was terrific help in planning the program, and particularly for being 
um, Fernandez, the Associate Director of Programs, who helped put this together. And finally, our other co-sponsor is the Center for Leadership and Education at the University of Richmond. Um, and their director is Tom Shields. And we very much appreciate all of the co-sponsorships. I'd also like to thank the, the um, ABA Journal of Labor and Employment Law um, and the co-editors of that, Steve Beffert and Laura Cooper, who are both here and both on the panel. And They'll be publishing the papers from the conference, and um, that's a, a publication that goes out to all of the labor and employment law section members um, nationally. So that's where the, the final versions of the papers that, um, that you see will be published. So we very much appreciate their, their publishing those papers. I'd like to give some special thanks to the, the law school faculty members, who, um, staff members who um, helped put this together. Sherry Harrington did a phenomenal job of all of the logistical stuff, including uh, the last minute change um, to this venue. And certainly we apologize for any inconvenience that caused, but as Dean Purdue said, we really couldn't um, do anything other than move here. And, and we're very appreciative of the Weston Hotel for um, setting all of this up at the last minute. This happened on Wednesday. Um, and so um, we're very appreciative that they were able to put this together and, and host us here. Um, other uh, staff members that have helped Hilda Billups, my administrative assistant, has been a tremendous help. Jessica Parad um, did the publicity. And uh, Susan Atkinson, our career services office, um, stepped in at the last minute to help us with registration out there. Um, Carl Hong, our multimedia person, is in the back. If you have multimedia questions, he's back there. And very much appreciate his, again, last minute change to do it here instead of at the law school. And I also want to thank our, our law students. You saw some of them at the registration table. Um, Will Warwick and Meredith Fleming are my research assistants. They put together some of the materials for this. Um, we also have um, Davis Powell, who is helping, another third year law student, and a group of students from our chapter of the American Constitution Society, as well as the Law and Economics Association, Student Association. So. Um, I take an opportunity to meet those law students. They're all terrific folks. Um, if you have any jobs, talk to our law students. <laughs> I think that's all my thank yous. I hope I haven't forgotten anybody, but if I have, um, thanks to everyone who has put this together, and particularly to all of our speakers and moderators. Um, we have a fascinating program set up for you today. Um, these issues that we're going to be talking about are issues that are dominating the news, dominating the public debate. Um, and we have a, a series of real experts on these issues, bringing a variety of perspectives. Um, we have academics, uh, lawyers, economics experts, labor policy experts, we have practitioners um, on the union side, on the management side, and so. Um, it's going to be a terrific program, and um, we'll start it now. I want to turn it over to my colleague, Paul Thompson, who will be moderating the first panel and introducing um, our speakers on the first panel. Thanks, Ann, very much. Uh, my role as moderator is going to be a quick cool role. We, we talked, Ann and I talked yesterday, and we decided that in the interest of time, we will not introduce the speakers at any length. You all have the biography, I believe, in the package in front of you. If I'm wrong on that, please correct me. We thought it was the right the program. I did want to talk a little bit about the procedure first. And, and what we are going to do is to start with the gentleman on my left, I mean, on my right, Robert Clark, and we're right down the line with Derek Revere and then Jeffrey Beach and Jason Strickland. And they're all going to talk about 15 to 18 minutes. I've been told that my job is to monitor that, so I will do my best in doing it. Then we will have questions and answers after that is over. We thought that would be the best way so we could try to finish by 1045. I think you're going to find this panel to be a very interesting panel. And, and if you look at the papers, they are excellent papers. I have read them. Up. They do give different perspectives on the issue. And without any further ado, I'm just going to start off. 
the gentleman on my right, Dr. Robert Clark. One thing that's interesting, three out of our four speakers are not lawyers. I haven't been to many legal things, but I haven't taken place, but I think that's interesting and should be very important. Thank you. Pleased to be here, and I am one of those non-lawyers, but I'm going to try to raise a series of issues about both the economics of public pension plans, but also talk a bit about some of the legal issues that, if you folks have some influence, you might be able to address. So just a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, first, uh, we just need to know some things about what the current landscape is. And for those of you who don't know the difference between various types of pension plans, we'll take just a minute to talk about that. Uh, we'll look at the fiscal concerns, uh, financial issues that are really dominating the news on public pension plans these days. And then we'll talk a little bit about how uh, public uh, institutions are examining and re-examining uh, the pension plans that they're providing to their employees. One thing that you have to think about when you consider both the current state of pension plans and or other benefits uh, is not just the cost, which gets all the attention these days, but it's also how do these benefit plans affect worker behavior in terms of attracting and retaining workers. And so I want to make sure we spend a little bit of time on that as well. So perhaps we, we, we should just uh, begin with where are we in the, the, the evolution of public pension plans. Uh, they're relatively new, actually. Uh, so we, the first statewide benefit plan for general state employees, generally accredited to Massachusetts in 1911. Uh, these plans evolved over the course of the 20th century, uh, and the last state pension plan was established about 1967 uh, in South Dakota. Uh, so now all states have a variety of pension plans, actually. Uh, in general, most states have a pension plan that covers all of their state employees except certain groups. Of course, the legislators have to have a separate plan for themselves and think about that. Uh, but then judges often have a plan. Oftentimes, uh, the police officers of various types have separate uh, statewide plans. Uh, of course, a big a component of public employment is teachers, and teachers often have their own separate plan, and sometimes they're, they're merged uh, with public plans. It, it, in fact, the public pension plan in the world actually got started in, at the local level in the big cities with plans for teachers, firemen, and uh, policemen. Uh, and over time, states organized some of those local plans into statewide plans for these types of workers, especially teachers. Except in some, some states, you still find that the biggest cities that had the oldest pension plans are outside the statewide plan uh, for teachers. Another trend over the course of the 20th century was when states merge their teacher plans with their general state employee plans. And so in North Carolina, we have something called the Teachers and State Employees Plan that covers all public school teachers as well as virtually all uh, state employees. Uh, and about half the states have these combined plans, and about half the states have separate plans uh, for uh, teachers. Over the course of the 20th century, of course, we know that in 1935, the Congress passed the Social Security Act, and maybe some of you uh, do work on Social Security, uh, you would know that initially the Congress specifically excluded public sector employees from coverage by Social Security. And that was actually one of the impetus for plans uh, expanding at, at the state and local level because they noticed everybody else had a Social Security, and so they started offering plans uh, for their own workers. In 1950, Congress began a series of uh, legislation, adopting a series of legislation that allowed state and local workers into Social Security, but did not require them uh, to enter. So over the course of the 20th century, we saw a lot of movement in these plans, and they basically are all of these defined benefit types. Uh, virtually all public sector employees are covered by a pension plan today that you could compare that with in the private sector, about half the labor force is covered by a pension plan. These plans are generally more generous uh, than the ones in the public sector. They're virtually all uh, still defined benefit plans in the public sector. Uh, I assume everybody knows basically what a defined benefit plan is. It uh, defines the benefit that you're going to get, usually 
basically is a percent per year of service times some salary average, as opposed to a defined contribution plan, something like a 401k plan, which are dominating the, the private sector now. So 20th century was a big 100-year uh, coverage in the development of state and local pension plans. What we, what's dominating the news these days is the fact that these plans tend to be underfunded, and in many cases, dramatically underfunded. Uh, the published uh, funding ratios, that is assets divided by liabilities, uh, tend to be somewhere in the 70, 80 percent range. There are a few states that do a good job, including North Carolina, always mentioned as one of the top four or five best managed and funded uh, pension plans in the country. Uh, but other states are much less well managed and less well funded. And uh, depending on what you read, there is a very interesting debate in the public sector pension world about how liabilities should be uh, valued. Uh, economists, finance experts tend to have one view that you know, these are liabilities and they should be discounted at a real interest rate, which typically might be about 4%. Uh, plan managers, uh, politicians like to think of it we should be able to discount those future liabilities by a much higher rate, typically referred to as the expected return on uh, those pension assets, and they tend to discount liabilities by about 8% on average. If you understand present value calculations, you know that those make a huge difference in the uh, size of the projected liabilities. So the reported unfunded liabilities in the public pension world are about one trillion dollars if you discount by four percent instead of the seven eight percent uh, those numbers are about three and a half trillion dollars and the funding ratios would be about 50 percent or less rather than the 70 or 80 percent that are uh, listed in most of these actuarial reports you may know if this is your area that the government of county standards board has just come out with some new regulations about how this would be modified these regulations tend to satisfy nobody. They are sort of in the middle ground that, uh, without going into particular details, uh, are somewhere between the seven and eight, nine percent that uh, uh, plans are currently using and the four percent that uh, economists are supposed to recommend that they use. Uh, when we look at the generosity of these plans, one another thing that happened over the course of the 20th century is that. Again, uh, legislators uh, decided to make them more generous. And if you look at the benefit for, let's say, a typical 30-year employee across all of the state plans, that benefit uh, mm -hmm. increased by about 10% over the 30 years from the mid-1970s uh, to the early part of the 21st century, uh, raising a 30-year replacement rate from about 50% to about 56% uh, and during that period of time. And one of the reasons that we are in the difficulties that we are today is that the benefits were increased without adequate attention given uh, to the cost of improving those benefit plans. Uh, states often, uh, in their wisdom of their legislatures, tend not to fully fund the annual increase in their pension contributions that are suggested by the actuaries. So you have two things going on during that last quarter of the 21st century. Legislators increasing benefits, not paying for them, and even not even making the uh, regular annual required contribution as uh, calculated by the actuaries. So here we are, and today, uh, anytime you pick up your New York Times or your Wall Street Journal or maybe even the Richmond <laughs> Times Dispatch, you probably once or so a week find that there's a story about public sector pension plans. Uh, and the highlight basically is that these cost a lot of money. They're much more generous than in the private sector. Uh, they're underfunded. States are recognizing that they're likely to have to put more money into these. And there's a general idea across the country that the increased cost of the public sector pensions will restrict what state and local governments can do on other things. So if, for example, you are concerned about funding public education, and you notice that the cost of your pension plan is increasing as a proportion of your state budget, that's going to crowd out something 
unless you continue to uh, raise uh, your taxes and increase your benefits. So across the country, state after state is looking at these plans and trying to make some modification. First, many states, I would say virtually all states, are looking at the generosity of these benefits. And state after state has considered various modifications. They've set up uh, statewide commissions to study how to modify pension plans. I chaired a commission in North Carolina to look at the state pension in North Carolina to see if we should be making some changes, even though it's one of the best managed, best funded plans in the country. I have a very uh, uh, forward-looking treasurer, state treasurer, who's the chief fiduciary officer of the pension plan. And her position was, this may have been the right pension plan for the last 50 years. Is it the right plan for the next 50 years? It's a very good way of looking at this. Other states are in a much worse position for trying to make these changes by looking at their current status. So what are they trying to do to reduce benefits? Across the country, you see lots of states increasing the normal retirement age uh, for the, their pension plan, increasing the number of years to be vested in that pension plan increasing the averaging period over which they calculate your final average salary to calculate your benefit, uh, reducing COLAs is the hot issue right now and there are some court cases uh, in both Minnesota and Colorado that have said that it's all right for the state to reduce COLAs relative to what they had promised before, and also increasing uh, worker contributions. Now from a legal perspective, uh, those of you that are interested in public plans, a very interesting uh, approach to these plans for whatever reason 30 50 years ago states introduced various pieces of legislation and lines into their country uh, con uh, uh, constitutions to say basically that you couldn't reduce public pension benefits for workers now i'm not sure about the history so uh, and can write a paper on this it would be how did this happen that they wrote the law this way or the Constitution this way. Because in the public sector, in the private sector, uh, you are guaranteed by federal legislation the benefit that you've approved to date. But the company can change the pension plan going forward and do whatever they want to. They can cancel, they, and that's for current workers. Everything you work for up to date, you're guaranteed, but future benefits is a whole new deal. Uh, and a lot of them, as you may know, companies have changed those plans. They switch from defined benefits, to defined contribution, they reduce benefits, they've done a lot of things. In the public sector, it seems that the interpretation is that you cannot change the benefits after the person is hired on day one. Now this really makes no sense from an economic standpoint. Uh, it is basically saying, we guarantee you this one part of your compensation for the rest of your career won't be any less than this formula that we give you today. But in fact, we don't guarantee you a job, we can fire you, we can lay you off, we don't guarantee you a wage increase, we don't guarantee you anything else but this one thing. It's very strange. And it prevents states and local governments from being able to make major changes that have really significant cost savings immediately. So if you're thinking about changing a pension plan and it's going to take effect only for new hires, it's really not going to have much effect on your cost for the next 30 years. And so one of the things that you should be considering if you are a legal expert in this is how would you change that? Even if, if the courts are backing that current provision to the hilt, uh, you might go about changing the Constitution and the laws now so that in the future you have the option of changing benefits for current workers. Not the ones that are already there, so it's still gonna take some time, but it would give you that flexibility going forward. But this is a very interesting issue because in the court cases over the colors, uh, again, I haven't, uh, not the legal expert, but uh, you should ask some of those in the room. What seems to have been the case was that the courts were saying that the COLAs, even though they were promised to workers in, in a particular way, weren't part of the core promise of the pension benefits that were having it afterwards, and the courts ruled in favor of the governments in those two cases. Other big change going on is that states are looking around and adopting new options. Uh, some states have adopted DC plans and terminated their DD plans. Uh, only two states have done that in its entirety. Alaska and Michigan, two very interesting and like different states, have only DC plans for their new employees, for their existing employees. Uh, another more recent trend is the adoption of choice between DB and DC plans. So there are about six states that currently allow their employees to have a choice when they're hired 
do you choose a DD plan or a DC plan? Now, this is a choice, and incidentally, this for a long time, and lots of states been given to university faculty members. Even though everybody else in the state has to go into the DD plan, if you're on a university faculty, like I am at North Carolina State University, when I'm hired, I have the choice between the state DD plan or what we call an optional retirement plan, which is a DC plan. That choice only for the, uh, only a, a faculty member. Somebody else gets that choice. But in these six states, they're now giving a much wider range of choice. Another uh, major trend that's going on is this movement toward what I call combination plans, which is basically saying let's reduce the defined benefit plan, but combine it with a mandatory defined contribution plan. And about six states uh, have done that. So one of the trends going on out there is greater choice for workers and greater options to choose things like defined contribution plans. As I mentioned earlier, if you're worried about the cost of these plans, you ought to also be worried about how they affect your workers. These plans are often used to attract workers, to certain to retain workers, motivate workers, and also ultimately retire them. Uh, there's a long literature in uh, the labor economics about the incentives of these types of plans, and if you're interested, uh, we could talk about that. But you better want those incentives if you keep them. And if you change them, you better recognize that people are likely to change their behavior. So questions would be, do we really want public sector workers retiring in their mid-50s or, or right around age 60? The answer is yes, we've got a good system to do that in many states. You might scratch your head and wonder, why do we want to encourage all these people to leave when they're still uh, productive workers? Another thing that you ought to think about in these plans is that they really treat young, not young, short career workers very poorly. So people, when they talk about the bond benefit plans, they tend not to talk about those effects. Uh, and uh, if you think about, I don't know what it is in uh, Virginia, but in many states, if you leave before you're vested, you get nothing. Uh, even after you're vested, you tend to only get your own contributions back. And this is very strange. So uh, you hire new workers, and they come in, they work for you for two or three years. If most of these state plans are contributory, so we take money out of your paycheck, and when you leave, we do the wonderful thing, we give you your money back. So we force you to give the state a no interest loan during the period of time. Does that make much sense? Suppose you were working in uh, Massachusetts. How many of you know that Massachusetts employees are not in Social Security? Oh, all those hands went up. Look at that. Uh, so you know, it's very interesting if you uh, brought down, uh, uh, instead of President Obama today, suppose you had Senator Kerry today, and you said, or do you support Social Security? Of course he'd say yes. How about for Massachusetts workers? Oh, he'd probably say no because Massachusetts has kept their employees out of Social Security because they think it's a bad deal for them. So if you work for Massachusetts, you're in the Massachusetts public pension plan, 10-year vesting. You leave before 10 years, no Social Security, no pension. Is that a pretty good deal? So all across all of these states, almost, with the exception of the ones that have gone to defined contribution plans, the young, short-term workers are treated pretty badly. Is that what we want? This Teach for America plan, right, that everybody's very excited about. You get smart kids, just graduated from college, they come and work for you for two or three years. Do you want those to teach in your schools? Well, you're asking them to give you a no interest loan for three years during their time. Not a very good deal. Okay, so we're running out of time, so let me just make a couple quick more points. Retiree health insurance. If you read your newspaper, you see almost as many stories about retiree health insurance uh, as you do pensions. From a legal standpoint, or those of you that have some influence in the legislature, it, it sort of boggles my mind that somebody is not looking at both pensions and retirement health plans. These tend to be, you know, they're both employee benefits, they both affect retirement, but they tend to be managed over here. They don't talk to each other. They have very different ways of management. Public pension plans, even though they're very poorly funded, retirement health plans are totally unfunded in almost every state. So the unfunded liabilities of health plans are approaching those of uh, uh, pension plans. Because things are happening in the world, supplemental pension plans are important to those of us across the country, in both the public and the private sector. As Social Security is likely to be changed, you can pick how you want to change it, uh, it's more likely that benefits will be lower in the future, we'll pay more for it. States are going to respond to that, they're likely to reduce their benefits because of that. And that's going to make supplemental pension plans more important in the public sector. I'll be happy to talk about that. I've been doing some research there as well. Individual responsibility, whether you keep these DB plans or not, 
more and more workers are going to have more and more responsibility for their own retirement income as benefits are changing. And that really means, and the last point is, I think financial literacy is a very important issue. I've been doing research on that. Financial literacy in the workplace is a key to understanding how to save for retirement. We spend our lives at our jobs. Most of what we need to know about saving for retirement is related to our employee benefits. Financial literacy is a key, and we should be thinking about that uh, throughout. So with that, let me put this last slide. If you're interested in anything about what I've been talking about, there's a special issue of the Journal of Pension Economics and uh, Finance that uh, contains about 10 papers from a conference that I organized last year. Uh, lots of different aspects of pensions there. And then two recent books uh, that I just published on retiree health and pensions will tell you everything I think about public pensions. Thank you very much. And in 2011, 
the major uh, means by which to cut benefits has been to increase employee contribution rates, change the formula for how pension benefits are determined, and also to change the COLA rate for retirees. So really, we have now from all of these pension reform efforts, we have litigation pending in at least 10 states. And here I'd like to explain that you know the success of these challenges depends, of course, on how each state protects pensions, and in turn, how the United States Con United States Constitution's contract clause for the state equivalent would bear upon that. So with that in mind, I'd like to describe the legal protections that states provide, an overview of the contract clause, and then look at the litigation that had gone on in Colorado and in Minnesota. So let's start with the way that states protect pensions. There's really four approaches. One, contractual. Two, proprietary. Three, promissory estoppel and for the gratuity approach. So generally a public employee, if they're in a state that protects pensions through the contractual approach, they have greater protection than if you were in a state that treated them as a proprietor, a property interest, or as gratuity. So the contract approach is the majority standard throughout the country. And it really stems from either a constitutional provision, a statutory provision, or a court decision. And so under this approach, a contract relationship is said to exist between the state as an employer and the public employee regarding the statutory uh, provisions that grant the benefits. And some characterize this relationship really as an insurance contract between the state and the employee, or others have classified this as uh, deferred employee compensation in order to get to sort of a contract uh, relationship being established. So, on the one end of the spectrum in terms of protection, under the contract approach, you have uh, pensions being absolutely protected in Illinois and New York through constitutional provisions. These provisions protect uh, the pensions that public servants have, uh, the benefits that they have, uh, based upon the, the rights the pension plan in place when they join the system, <coughs> as well as any future benefits that come about from service. These benefits cannot be reduced unilaterally by the legislature for any reason, and, but as a contract, they can be modified if there is mutual agreement to change it. To move down a notch in terms of con contract pr protection are California, Washington, and other states that use what's called a less restrictive or limited vesting approach. And what that means is that benefits still vest when you start employment, but the legislature can make reasonable changes to those benefits uh, before an employee retires or before they uh, become eligible to retire. Now these changes have to be reasonable. They have to have some material relation to the pension system's success and more, most importantly, provide the employee with some kind of offsetting advantage. And once these employees retire, however, their pension rights are deemed to be absolutely vested. And uh, depending on the state you're in, they may or may not be subject to impairment through a contract clause analysis. Now, still other states have used a contract approach, such as Hawaii and Michigan. They only protect the benefits that are earned after employees provide service. So this mirrors the model that's found in ERISA in the private sector. So in these states, uh, they are able to have the legislature prospectively change the benefits that employees will earn via future service. So you earn it on a day-by-day -day basis. What you've earned, you keep it, it's protected, but they can change it going forward. Finally, under the contract approach, there are a host of states that protect pension benefits only after you become eligible to retire or you actually retire. Prior to that point, the legislature can go ahead and modify or revoke the plan entirely. And again, depending on the state, the, the vested benefits may or may not be reduced under the contract clause. So in some, you see there's a range of protection even within the contract approach to uh, protected benefits. The next approach is, approaches are the proprietary 
and promissory estoppel approaches. There are a handful of states that utilize either of these approaches. And the proprietary approach is this. Public employees obtain a property interest in statutory retirement benefits once they satisfy the eligibility requirements. That interest, however, is protected merely from arbitrary legislative action under the due process clause. So in other words, the legislature can modify the pension benefits of public employees so long as there is a rational basis for doing so. Now, Minnesota stands out as a one state that uses the promissory estoppel approach. And in that, under that approach, public employees have a protected interest in a pension program that's, however, subject to reasonable unilateral changes by the legislature from time to time. Under this approach, what the focus is on is what's the reliance interest of the public employee in the specific pension benefit that's at issue based on the language in the statute. Under this approach, the, the, uh, the legislature can cut benefits if doing so will protect the pension system's fiscal integrity or the benefit obligations impose an adverse impact on the state budget. In short, both the proprietary and promissorial estoppel approaches provide little legal protection. Now, the final approach is called the gratuity approach. And this used to be the prevailing view throughout the country before the contract approach uh, began in cold sway and around the 1950s and thereafter. And really, the gratuity approach is this. It represents the, the, the notion that the government grants pension benefits to retirees or public employees as a gift. And that's a gift that the legislature, of course, can take away or change at any time, even if you retire. Now, today, there's only a few states, uh, Arkansas, Indiana, Missouri, Montana, and Texas, that appear to still adhere to the gratuity approach through at least one type of plan that they still offer. So let's move on to the contract clause and, that, and how that fits into this. In Colorado and Minnesota, the litigation that has grabbed the headlines, the primary argument against the pension reform efforts has been that the changes made by the legislature violate the contract clause or its equivalent. So it's important to briefly look at the contract clause. Back in 1934, during the Great Depression, the Supreme Court held that the state, a state may, utilize, may substantially impair private contracts so long as that impairment is reasonable and necessary to serve an important public purpose that the legislature has, has identified. In 1977, however, the Supreme Court clarified that state attempts to impair, it, impair its own contracts, especially its financial obligations, are subject to greater scrutiny and very little deference because the state's self-interest is at stake. As the court bluntly put it, if the state could reduce its obligations whenever it wanted to spend money for what it regarded as an important public purpose, then the contract clause would provide really no benefit at all. Now, of course, before we can get to a contract clause violation, we have to have a contract. And long ago, the US Supreme Court developed what's called the unmistakability doctrine as a means to discern whether state statutory provisions like public pension plans constitute contract obligations for contract clause purposes. Under this doctrine, the law does not create contractual or vested rights unless the state, the statute clearly contains language to the contrary. As uh, to be discussed, the state defendants in both Colorado and Minnesota rely heavily upon the unmistakability doctrine as a means by which to justify their pension reform legislation. They also claim that their reform efforts are reasonable and necessary to maintain the viability of the pension system, despite comparing pension benefit rights. So the lawsuits in Colorado uh, and Minnesota, in my opinion, I believe, best capture really this confluence of state law protection uh, and 
court raised the question of whether the law will facilitate or defeat reform efforts in light of the contract clause or unmistakability doctrine. Colorado's uh, litigation really presents a showdown of whether the contract clause even applies. In 2010, Colorado passed comprehensive pension reform legislation, cutting the, the pension benefit rights for both current employees and retirees. And this legislation was a bipartisan success and received the support of public employee unions. Uh, retirees, however, sued under the contract clause to retain the higher COLA rate that was in place when they retired. And the lawsuit centers on really the relevance of a 1959 Colorado Supreme Court decision. In that decision, the court adopted the contractual approach and held that public servants obtain vested contractual rights uh, to a pension plan's terms once they fulfill the eligibility requirements uh, to retire. And the court explained that once these rights vest, they are, quote, not subject to a unilateral change of any type whatsoever. <coughs> this conclusion, the court stated, stems from the cardinal principle that parties shall know prior to entering into the, a business relationship the conditions which shall cover the relationship. The state defendants claim that the 1959 decision no longer applies because of a 2002 Colorado Supreme Court case. In that decision, uh, the court concluded that the contract clause only protects uh, a, con a, con a contract that affords a vested right. And so from this point, you have the state defendant seizing on the issue of, well, does the statute that provides for the COLA provide clear language that makes the COLA rate the vested right for retirees. And to support their position that it does not, they pointed to the fact that over the last four years, the legislature had changed the COLA rate. So in July of 2011, uh, the Colorado trial court agreed with the state and they dismissed the retirees' contract clause claim. Interestingly though, the court reached this conclusion without even discussing the 1959 Supreme Court decision at all. And really, the case now that it's on appeal broaches the question of whether retirees in Colorado have absolutely protected rights or they have received any protection under the contract laws. The final state is Minnesota. As with Colorado, Minnesota enacted pension reform legislation in 2009 and 2010 affecting current employees and retirees. The legislation stemmed from investment losses inflicted by the stock market crash and failed efforts to increase taxes uh, to balance the state budget. So like Colorado, retirees challenged the unilateral cut of the pension polo rate that they had. Now since Minnesota adopts the promissory estoppel approach, the pension benefit rights do not begin with a presumption of having contractual protection. So accordingly, uh, the Minnesota litigation really centers on whether the COLA provision at issue takes clear language giving retirees a fixed right. And even if it did contain such language, though, the retirees still would have to show to the court that the COLA reduction was, was substantial and unreasonable. Uh, in July, the a Minnesota trial court held that the plaintiffs struck out in all three respects. It said that the COLA rate contained no binding language to fix the benefits, the COLA reduction was not substantial, and that the COLA was a reasonable exercise of legislative authority to maintain the integrity of the pension system. So in sum, with respect to Minnesota and their approach to safeguarding benefits, it really facilitates the ability of the legislator, legislature to unilaterally cut benefits and creates a really uh, a significant obstacle under the unmistakability doctrine uh, to even be able to make a contract clause claim. So I expect that the appellate courts in Minnesota will uphold that reform. So let me just conclude by saying, uh, to sum up, you know, pension, public pensions are under siege because of the current fiscal climate in most states presents a political opportunity for change. And it's clear that politically it's more palatable to go after and cut 
pension benefits for public employees than it is to raise taxes, uh, cut services, or both. Although, for decades, the states that have been uh, providing these services, they have to also be frank with public employees that for decades they have not been making full payments to their pension systems and have been using their pension systems, frankly, as a credit card by which to advance money for services without paying for it today. So to wrap up, success really depends upon the type of approach that the state has adopted, uh, as I mentioned today. Thanks for your time.